Thank you all very much for coming. It's great to see you all. Um, yes, this is today about the empowerment of women and how the East and West see that subject. Um, I can see there's quite a few men in the audience as well, so that's great that you've shown your support for that. Um, I'll first of all introduce the panel. We have on our far right, we have uh, Rabia Bati. And she is the youngest elected councillor in the country, which is fantastic. I don't ask you how old you are. You look about 12, but <laughs> very well done. <laughs> and next to her, we have Vazia Kasuri. And she is the advisor, the senior advisor to Imran Khan. Is that correct? Yes. Um, which, of course, we all know is the um, movement for justice politician and um, very big in Pakistan. Um, welcome to you. And the um, Lady Mayor, which we've already been introduced to, but I'll introduce it to her again, that's Frances Stainton. Thank you very much for letting us be here today. <laughs> and of course, Sahel Chuktai, who is the TV Apex organizer and director, and he's sitting here on my right. Thank you very much for organizing Sahel. <laughs> now, as a female myself, you've probably noticed, um, I'm obviously very interested in this subject, as I'm sure we all are. Um, I would say that it's all about balance in life, which I think is something that Francis Stainton was talking to me earlier on about, in that we are 50-50% of the population and we should be represented that way. Um, I just have a few figures here that I drew off the internet um, that I'd like to quickly share with you about the proportions of seats held by women in national parliaments around the world. Obviously these are just a cross section. But it's interesting to me to see that the UK was only 23% and in Pakistan also 23%. These are figures taken from 2012, but that's only last year. Um, Nicaragua was 40% which was quite amazing, and Rwanda, even more amazing, 56%. Uh, so they're doing something right out there. Um, Sweden and Denmark, as we probably know, it's about 40%. Uh, Russia, 14%. And uh, Papua New Guinea, 3%. So we're not quite up there yet, but we're not quite there on the bottom. So um, I would like to first of all start off with um, Francis, would you like to give your thoughts on this subject? Uh, sorry, um, I would like to first of all start off with <laughs> Sahel, who will introduce this subject a little bit more, and then Francis will go to you. Thank you. I think this uh, term is not new, but I must thank uh, for, for, for your patience first. You've been very, very patient today, and uh, I, I welcome um, Rabia Bhatti, who is the youngest councillor, Mrs. Fawzi Kasuri, thank you very much, and Mayor Councillor um, uh, Francis Stainton. This term, women empowerment, is not new. I don't think I need to really go into details of that. Uh, but, but there is the whole history of West and East is glorified with examples of uh, strong ruling women. I mean, British history, you can look at the Queen Victoria, French history, Queen Mary, and then Muslim history. Uh, Razia Sultana, some 700 years ago, was a, was a great empress. And uh, Prophet uh, Muhammad's wife, uh, Aisha, she led the army fighting the battle. So Muslim and Asian, and East and West have great history of Muslim empowerment, uh, women empowerment. But there are dark patches as well. There, 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 there are moments when we should put our head down. For example, until 1857, women in West were not, did not have the right to take divorce. They could not ask for it. It was only applicable after 1857. And this is history. So there have been dark patches. And in spite of this right being imparted to Asian or Muslim women, they could not exercise it because of economic instability of themselves. They had no stance, a financial stance, to go for a divorce. So there have been dark patches. There have been glorified history. The history of women empowerment is evolving. And the direction and the pace of that is governed by few variables like um, culture, religion, uh, I think we should also include the socio-economic setup and the literacy of the, of, the, of the people because the men have to understand how important women empowerment is. So the literacy of the society is also important. When all these four variables are there and I think then two definitions of one figure, one term can be, right, can be right. East and West may have their own definitions of women empowerment and they can be equally right. 
You can't judge a woman, an Asian woman, let's say a Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi woman, not fully empowered by West standards. And that is the debate today. That we have to have, we have to accommodate what the East Eastern woman is going through while she's being empowered. And I think, I, I really hope that towards the end of the speeches, there would be uh, very uh, sparking questions from the audience, very learned audience, and uh, we all like to take home uh, more information and be more educated on this particular topic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Francis, over to you. I think we're all rather fascinated with this topic of bringing together the East and West women who some are in power and some are seeking power and some have suffered from power against them so we've got a lot to share together and I think it's going to be a very interesting debate I too am looking forward to the questions afterwards um, and I, I think that it's, it's really a, a, a variety of rather thought-provoking circumstances which we can explore together um, from my own point of view as life of a London mayor that brings me into contact with a vast spectrum of women. And my personal feeling is that we need balance. We need men and we need women. They are absolutely essential to one another. And I think any, any good government, any good situation, be it in public or even in private life, we need that complementary skills of the male and the female. So I'm very much in favour of balance, and balance in fact is the secret of life if you think about it. Many, many things come about through getting that balance of opportunity or whatever the two things are in the right proportion so that everybody has their fair chance. Um, and I think it's, uh, yes, I think I end up saying balance is, is uh, including both sexes is really the ideal formula. Um, and I, of course, see it happening on a weekly basis because I hold a ceremony called the Citizens Ceremony when people become English citizens. And in fact, my dear friend Pauline Lyle Smith is an Australian by birth, but after many, many years of living in London, she decided to become a citizen. And sadly, I wasn't the mayor at that time. But she will know that this is a very interesting ceremony where we all get together. I would think every race in the world comes here, and it it's really pause for thought. People are prepared to risk their lives to come and live in England illegally, anything to join our society. So those who come over and settle here and establish themselves and are now uh, through the various hoops of becoming a British citizen do get a lot of rights. <clears throat> and we also say, and responsibilities. And in our ceremony, we end up singing God Save the Queen and, and having made various vows, but they are basically to obey the laws of the country, but to be tolerant and to also to contribute as well as to receive. And that, I think, is the secret of it, because England for many centuries has welcomed every race in the world. We're multicultural, multi-faith, multinational, and multi-creed, and, and I think that is our richness and our strength. And today, women are taking a part in England quite easily, to the point we've even had a prime minister. So we don't have a great deal of battle getting empowered here in England, but we're very conscious of other countries, and particularly in the East, and one that I uh, particularly uh, admire and am astounded by is little Malala Yousafzai. She stood up for re-education for children, and she paid the price, as you probably all know. She was shot, and she came here to Birmingham, and she's been healed, and she's now taking part again, very courageously, in television interviews. But she's very, very mature for 16 when you look at her, and you think this is a, an exceptional soul who's got something particular to contribute to this progress of women. And so we, um, we founded, um, some friends of mine, I founded a charity which was called World Peace and Prosperity, and we gave awards to people who distinguished themselves nationally and internationally with um, exceptional services to humanity. And we gave her a prize, even though she was only 16. And I think that shows what, really at any age, a woman can soar up into the spheres of influence, and it, it just is utterly natural, and we, we salute it, and we respond to it, and we wish them all the best, and hope that there are many such people coming forward. Um, what else was I going to talk to you about? 
I do think that I should say that mayors are, not, are known not to be political. In our term of office, we don't take part in any one political side, because here, when I'm chairing the meetings, the meetings have the opposition and the administration, and they're probably fighting each other over something, and I have to keep them in order and make sure each gets a fair chance to put their, their arguments forward before we go to the vote, and then action is taken as a result. So I also look forward very much to um, hearing what the question and answers are, and I thank you for joining us today on this really very special occasion, which is entirely due to Apex's imaginative ideas. I've seen some of their programs, and each one I've found utterly enchanting and, and very informative. So I hope this one will be too. Thank you. Praise indeed. Thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to pass over now to Fazia Kasuri. And can I just say as well, when the speakers have had their, um, I think it's about five minutes they're speaking for each, then I'll take questions from the floor and observations and everything. So, Fazia. Good evening. Salikum. Thank you very much for being here. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Chiktai and Lady Mayor and all of you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come to this beautiful building and be part of, you know, a subject that is uh, spoken of any, everywhere in the world today. Um, women are an integral part of any society. And um, I'm happy to hear from you, Andrea, that uh, touching on the commonalities between Britain and Pakistan, we have the same number of percentage of representatives in uh, political uh, forums and in the assemblies. And um, like you said, Lady Mayor, you've had a British prime, uh, a woman prime minister. We've had a woman prime minister too. So that is something good. About women empowerment. Now the way I look at it is, I think it's all about opportunities. There is a growing discussion and debate all over the world on the importance of uh, the role of women uh, in all their respective countries. Now, uh, specifically in reference to Pakistan, more than half of the population of Pakistan comprises of women. And there is not a field, to my knowledge, in Pakistan where we will not see women participation. And not just that, but women excelling in the professions that they have adopted. Whether it is just grassroots community work, whether it is tending to the fields in, you know, in agriculture, whether it is the teaching profession. Uh, Pakistani female students are creating world records and incidentally as you all may be aware a record has just been created recently he's it's by a young man but he got 47 A's in his O level and A levels with the Cambridge University so it's a world record but I promise you that uh, women young girls today in the education sector are excelling boys I mean they're exceeding them in their performances and everything else so the way I look at it is that women Women empowerment will come through equal opportunities, political participation, economic op opportunities. Um, Asian countries, and especially in reference to Pakistan, um, the rural women are somehow more at a disadvantage than the women in the urban areas of our country. And women uh, in the rural areas uh, comprise of the majority. They are the bulk of the population, the female population in our country. And I think what is very important is education, uh, health care, well-being and a provision, a po poverty alleviation, I think, which will only come when we make um, economic um, uh, opportunities available to women. We have to facilitate them. They need an environment which can be conducive to their growth. You know, I always say this, um, I'm also, um, I've uh, been in the U.S. myself, I went to school there and I've lived there, a major portion of my adult life I've spent there. And, uh, and I know that uh, it's not that there is anything wrong with the genes of Pakistanis anywhere, but it's the environment in Pakistan that does not encourage their development and growth. We need to change that. And you can see Pakistanis, oh, I, I have a lot of interaction with the overseas Pakistanis, and I'm also Imran Khan's advisor on overseas Pakistanis, and I see the talent and, you know, the, the passion, the, the hard work, and how they make a 
positive contribution to the countries, to the societies of which, you know, the countries of which they're citizens. So the same thing can be achieved in Pakistan, and especially uh, with reference to women. But they need that push. We need to make those opportunities available for them. The environment has to be right. They have to be facilitated through legislation, through implementation of those laws that are made. We have quite a few pro-women laws in Pakistan. But unfortunately, I think that the men in Pakistan need to be enlightened and educated and made aware also of the rights of women, how they need to respect and accept that. So this is very important, I think, education. Uh, for the, uh, Pakistan, uh, the figures in education are not very encouraging. 46% uh, is the literacy rate, out of which 27% are uh, girls, women. And I think we need to pay more attention to education. We need to concentrate on that. We need to have more vocational centers. We need to have, we need to advance in those fields. We need to provide women legal aid in Pakistan. It's very heartening. I was going through certain statistics on the internet as well. And I noticed that despite the number of women who are in political parties today all over the world, who are more and more actively taking part in the uh, mainstream politics of, in their country, countries in their respective countries. 15.6% is a very small percentage of women globally who are still in, uh, um, you know, assemblies all over the world, in the Senate and the parliaments in the world. So I think this needs to be accelerated. This figure has to go up because women certainly have a potential. They need to be part of mainstream political parties. It has to be made mandatory on the parties, especially in reference to Pakistan, to to, um, you know, have as special measures to create those quotas to uh, encourage women, to wean them into the systems. Because in a country like Pakistan, women, their mobility is restricted. They are financially not capable. Their, their education, their, their, their discrimination when it comes to educating women, uh, families will pay more attention to sending their boys to school instead of the girls. So all this has to change considering the intelligence and the, the potential that women have to grow in, in our country as well. So I think what we really need to do is we need to take this debate and uh, have, you know, uh, discussions. Uh, a very vigorous uh, campaign needs to be conducted all over the world because generally women have the same issues. I mean, even if you look at the United States today, I was reading on healthcare, and in the United States, 90% of the the people who suffer from AIDS, women are the ones who are affected. They're in the larger majority. And obviously, if we look globally uh, in the ranking of countries, um, it saddens me to see that Pakistan is at number 56 when it comes to women empowerment. The Nordic countries in Europe, of course, take the lead. And Sweden is one of the best countries in the world for women, where they have actually, you know, women have always uh, been the marginalized gender. But this is something which is getting a lot of attention in the Western world because of, uh, you know, proper institutions here, more education, and uh, they realize that, uh, you know, women can be significant uh, role models and they are important players in the success and the national development programs of any country. So they pay more attention to them. And, um, you know, whatever little role women like me are playing in Pakistan, of course I belong to a political party and I belong to a party where we feel that we have provided a platform to the youth and women. And my work is not just um, restricted to women. When we speak of gender empowerment, we're talking about youth as well. You know, we do, like the lady mayor said, I couldn't agree more with anyone that, you know, empowerment should be across the board for men and women. We need, we're not against men. We, we want to uh, have a provision of equal opportunities for women as well, which has not been the case. But there is a trend, 
a changing trend which is developing in the entire world. The United Nation is very actively working on it. We have a lot of you know, NGOs, non-governmental organizations also that are working in Pakistan and trying to uh, facilitate the growth of women. It has to come from economic participation, from political participation. It has to come from providing women good health care, making healthy mothers for a healthy nation, educating the women. And um, it's all there and giving them a meaningful voice in their communities and in their societies so they can play a constructive role in the development of their country. And of course later on we'll take questions and answers. Right? Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting you say about 15% of um, the women are, um, did you say, across the board, worldwide, represented in parliaments? About 15%, you said. 15.6%. Because I worked out, 15.6%, okay. I worked out that we've got about 15% representation in our cabinet at the moment of women. So we're not that progressed, I don't think, at all. I think there's um, something like 5 out of 31 in the cabinet. So Mr. Cameron has to get his uh, act together on that one, I think. Um, three out of seven, so that's... Three out of seven, there you go, Willie. Okay, and someone who might know more about this than me is our um, last speaker, Rabia Abati. All right, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for having me. And after an entirely illuminating discussion that our panel have already touched upon, I don't really know what else to say, but I shall try my best. Um, to begin with, I would like to thank both the men and women behind this evening's wonderful debate, and of course to TV Epex for hosting us. It is an absolute pleasure to be here tonight to talk and address an issue that is incredibly close to my heart, an issue that's echoed in the corridors of Whitehall, in the halls of Westminster, and and indeed today in these very council chambers. When I think about Pakistan, of women, of empowerment, of progress, the concept goes hand in hand with an image of strife, tensions in global politics, challenges, inequality and injustice. And yet this image is not one that the women of Pakistan or indeed the public of Pakistan resonate with and indeed rightly so. Despite being beset with a growing number of problems, issues and calamities, the nation and those that dwell within its borders are making a statement of dedication day in and day out. And this is because they understand that there can be no true understanding or trust in a country divided by walls. Not only those walls, ladies and gentlemen, built of concrete and stone, but those walls we erect in our minds. Around the globe, in villages and cities, in times of stability and crisis, women are often the ones responsible for keeping communities thriving. We are the ones who nurture the bonds of family and friendship, who care for elderly relatives, volunteer in our children's classrooms, and organize community events that serve the common good. We know from experience that sharing a neighborhood is not the same as being good neighbors any more than eating French fries is indeed about being French. We understand that empowering one another means actively reaching out and inviting one another into our homes to talk, but more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, to listen. And we have learned that often when we exchange the details of our lives, the superficial factors that seemingly divide us fade away. We may not look or dress the same, we may not even worship the same way, but when it comes to what makes us laugh or cry, when it comes to what we dream of for our futures, when indeed it comes to how hard we work each day, we are usually more alike than we are different. We have also learned that the more we are able to understand and appreciate someone else's perspective, the more dimension, depth and texture we ultimately add to our own. Putting ourselves in each other's shoes, and indeed our women's size six feet shoes, ladies, and viewing the world from her vantage point and enhances our ability to empathize, compromise, and indeed collaborate in order to move forward. But if we women are to fortify acceptance in our societies, we must each play an active role, like thousands of individual stars that illuminate the skies. In my part of the world, I see inspiring efforts each day. 
I see Muslim women, British women, Pakistani women, women of different, gen uh, different ethnicities, different cultures, different religions and different backgrounds, forging networks with female executives in other countries, sharing best, pra best practices, creating new partnerships, empowering one another to succeed. I see these women joining global efforts to lift the lives of others. And I also see a promise at the grassroots level, far removed from the headlines and the spotlights, often among women who will never have the chance to travel beyond their homeland. I see these women using their influence as mothers, teachers and role models to transmit values of tolerance, open-mindedness and respect for diversity to their children. But as Muslim women stand up and speak out about who we are, what we believe and where we are going, as we reach out, we are all visionary women from different cultures and backgrounds, but with so much to give, learn, build and uphold. For if we are to build a better world, we must start by building bridges of friendship, asking the questions and listening to the answers that underpin trust and connection. In the words of the 19th century writer George Sand, one of the boldest, bravest women of her time, no one makes a revolution by himself, and there are some revolutions which humanity accomplishes without quite knowing how, because it is everybody who takes them in hand. So let us take our destiny and the future of our nations in hand. As women from around the world, let us spark not only a revolution of acceptance and hope for generations to come, but become an example of the unity in sisterhood and a beacon of women empowerment. We women bring unique values, skills and strengths to the challenges that the global world faces today. We are communicators, we are negotiators, peace builders and priority setters, examples of which we can see from around the world, stretching from Northern Ireland to Rwanda and to Colombia. But to be successful, we have to stick together. We have to support one another, not only at home, but across the boundaries of geography, culture and race, and show by example that what humanity has in common is more powerful than anything that can divide us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, three fascinating women here, glamorous and gorgeous and brainy. So who wants to ask the first question to whom? OK, have the first. Shall I bring the mic over? Yes, OK. Would you like to see your name and question? Yeah, um, Councillor Sitaranjan from the neighboring borough of Ealing. Um, my first question is uh, from Fozia Kasuri. Um, the topic which is also very close to my heart and I'm glad that you touched upon important issues that like Pakistani women are not short of any talent or skills but they have not been provided the environment where they can excel and your message certainly appeals to the educated class of Pakistani women but a country where most of the women they live in the rural, rural part and they are not educated how would you appeal to those women and how would you simplify your question and make sure that they, they know what is the meaning of women empowerment for pa Pakistani women because a lot of women they do not even know their basic rights so how would you uh, make sure that these women also know about the women empowerment and also a society which is male dominated without their help and support obviously we cannot achieve what we want to achieve so how can we um, you know, get support from, from the, uh, you know, the male-dominated society and all the politicians of different, different parties to come together, uh, you know, get on the same platform and, and, and make sure that they do something for, for the uh, benefit of women of Pakistan. Right. Um, the, the rural women of Pakistan, they are a major contributor in the agricultural force. Unfortunately, they have very discriminatory laws in Pakistan. Women in Pakistan, the rural women, do not have the right to own land. They do not have the right to maintain their own land in certain cases where they have agricultural land. You know, pa Pakistan being a very patriarchal society, it's very male dominant. And I understand that the challenges are really huge in this respect. Even where women have access to owning land, it is somehow taken over by the male uh, family members and they're in charge of it and you know they look after it. Although women are the ones who are tending the fields, they're working out. 
I think what is really needed is that we need to have big time land reforms in Pakistan. We have to enable women to have property rights, to own that land, to till that land, to work on it, and then, you know, to avail of the fruits that come from that land. So this is, it's not easy. You're absolutely right. It is not easy. Then again, you know, once I think, why I say poverty alleviation, if we take the example of Bangladesh, Bangladesh, and if we take the example of Grameen Bank and BAC, I mean, these are world-renowned institutions. I mean, they have brought about a revolution in Bangladesh only by empowering women through these small petty loans. You know, my daughter, uh, she um, graduated from the University of Virginia this year in anthropology and economics, and she went to Grameen Bank and interned with Dr. Eunice there for three months. She actually saw it herself, and I just felt so proud when I heard, we read it, but you know, when you hear from somebody firsthand and they've seen it, the women in the villages of Bangladesh are those women who now own the factories, they own their homes, and they are employing their sons and husbands in those factories. So, you know, I mean, it just shows that if you equip the women with the uh, support that they need, with the tools, with the education, with a little bit of training, and give them that little bit of push that they need. They will make it happen. And you know, another thing which is very important, I must say this because I do believe in this. No offense to any of the males who are sitting here, the men, but whenever a woman is empowered, believe me, she shares that with her children, with the family. If you give women money, they're going to buy clothes for their children. They'll think of sending their kids to school. Not all men do that. You know, men have other distractions in life. But women, they're only the mother is thinking about her child. She's thinking how best she can help, the, uh, you know, shape the future of her child. So we have all these things that we need to do. That's why I said we need to have a rigorous campaign, lots of lobbying for women's rights, to speak about them at different forums, at all tiers of um, you know, governance it should be spoken about. And particularly Pakistan Tariq and Saf, of which I'm a member, uh, we have a very, um, uh, very good local bodies empowerment program where we feel that empowerment of the people has to come from the bottom up. So you, um, uh, you know, empower those at, at the grassroots level, at the village levels. They are the ones who will take care of their communities. And we want to bring that awareness in women. And I, as a political activist, when I'm out in the field in Pakistan and I go to different, um, you know, villages and in the rural areas, I always tell the women that they should come forward in their communities to do something, to contest the local body's election. Be there, make a difference, be a a real voice in your community, but it will need time. Okay, well, you know, television has changed a lot of things in the world, especially in Pakistan. So whereas, you know, I mean, uh, our uh, rural areas, there's not so much literacy and they don't have access to, in, you know, uh, technologies like the internet or newspapers and things like that. So, but they all have television, they all have the cable and, you know, they see images. So in a way, it's just what media has done in Pakistan is just fantastic because it's brought everyone like it was happening in your neighborhood. So you actually see, you know, like they say, seeing is believing. So you see a lot of the misery, you see the problems, you see the discussions, you hear them, and it registers better with you. And believe me that the women in the rural areas of Pakistan also are quite aware, but for just from watching television, and they find it very nice, they love it that you know there are women like us who don't have their heads covered but we're talking about women's rights and we want them to to go to school and you know I mean they find they may have their heads covered nothing against that that's perfectly fine everyone's entitled to be the way they are but it's like they receive us like you know we are women and like I said anywhere in the world I think globally women relate to their issues because they're common issues common problems that women face all over the world Thank you very much. Um, Natasha Sheikh, who um, is the uh, Global Art and Cultural Foundation, is that correct? Would you like just to say a few words for us? Thank you. 
Thank you. Yes, um, firstly, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, Mayor of Hammersmith, Dr. Sohel Chukdai, Mrs. Fawzi Kasuri, and the rest of the councillors. And ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Natasha, as was just said. I've heard the discussion, which is uh, so brilliant, and in my project as well. We do a lot of uh, recognizing and promoting women who are empowered and empowering women. What has been discussed is fine. Uh, we are absolutely aware there's a lot of empowered women like yourself back in Pakistan. There's a lot of empowered women here as well. However, what I see different in Pakistan or Pakistani women, I can walk around as I am right now on my own without my husband who is actually with me today. But I would be fine. I'm still empowered enough to be bold enough to walk out, do what I have to do. I'm a, a, an activist with the local political party. And I'm able to do all that. But back from Pakistan, when we have all these empowered women and they're so good and they're so brilliant and like you, so vocal and so knowledgeable, we still need the support of men. Somehow or the other, we need that male figure with us. We need our husband or our partner or our father or a brother with us to walk with us, stand maybe behind, which is good because you're the empowered person there, but we need that. In all this, the immense thing is, I think that's wonderful that we accept it as our culture. There is no denying the fact that that is a support which is well needed in a culture like Pakistan. So we're not trying to get rid of that culture. It's brilliant. You have the support if family is supporting or a member or a cousin or whoever is supporting. That's brilliant. But this is an opportunity that you have as a minority. This opportunity is not available to so many other women as a majority. And those women, mind you, are very empowered within the four walls of their houses. They manage the budget, they manage the children, they decide which school it goes to, as we were discussing earlier. Women do everything. They're so empowered back in Pakistan, especially in the rural areas. They decide each and everything, except for, uh, like Raman Bhai said, buying a car. That's when the man puts his foot down and says, no, I'm going to decide that. Same but, here. But, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, with those women, being empowered at home is brilliant. Yes, that is really important. But to bring them out and have them empowered outside, I believe the men need to be empowered in themselves and to be tolerant enough and to be exposed to the fact and to know and understand and support their wives or you know whoever it is, the woman in their house, to be able to not be threatened that there's a woman in my house who is so empowered, she's bold enough to go out there, take a step, do something in her life. Now, my question would be, how would you, and you being an advisor, and I, I read uh, advisor to Imran Khan on uh, women's issues, how would you go about educating these men particularly? And it's not just to the rural areas, it is all over. And it's here as well. It's not that it doesn't exist here, but it doesn't, it, not in such a huge amount, but back in Pakistan, it is very much in your face. It's in everybody's daily life. How would you, or what, what policy would you bring in place to actually educate these people, the men, to not feel threatened by a woman who's strong enough to, and vocal enough and empowered enough to actually go out, make a difference and make your own country better. Okay, so that's the question. Here's the mic for the answer. <laughs> How would you educate men? That's the one. Okay, so the way I look at it, Natasha, you, you know you made a very valid point and I said that earlier as well. You know, there's a particular mindset. Uh, and especially in countries where we are from. So we have to bring a change in that. And it's not easy because, you know, it's embedded in the minds of the men. They are the people who take charge. They are the people who uh, are the, you know, the uh, head of the family. And um, it's not easy. But how we crack through that, I personally feel, is through strong institutions. We need to have institutions in Pakistan. Pakistan, 
we need to have laws that are implemented in Pakistan. We have a lot of good laws on paper, but they're never implemented. We never see anyone who is punished or you know, de deprived of something useful to them because they broke a law. We don't see, um, uh, you know, crimes are committed all the time, and it's the rule of the mighty, and it's all people who have a lot of clout and political influence, they get away with murder. So this is not right. It has to change. And I'll give you a very brief example. By the way, Aap Rashid Rahman Sabe. Okay, all right. I wasn't sure. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll give you a very brief example that uh, there was a senator from Balochistan. And uh, there was an incident that happened in Balochistan about uh, six, seven years ago that uh, four or five women were burnt alive, right, in fire. And the senator who did that, who was responsible for that, uh, when uh, the women's uh, female senators in the Senate uh, spoke about it, and we all did too, I mean, we were not in the Senate, but we spoke about it and raised a hue and cry in the media. Well, I mean, what an atrocity, what a horrendous crime it was, and that this senator should be taken to task. So Asif Ali Zardari, who was the president at the time, he actually appointed him uh, in the cabinet in return for that. So, I mean, you see, I mean, what a gross violation, what an insult to the intelligence of people like us, or anybody for that matter. But how do you fight that system? How do you fight this anomaly? It can only be done if we have institutions to fall back upon. In the civilized Western world, they have institutions. It doesn't matter. A person's not that important. It is the institution that matters. It is the system. It is the justice system. It is the way things are done in civilized societies. So we need, we need to work on those in Pakistan. And gradually, with the passage of time, it will be a slow process. But it will happen. But we have to try our best and just keep working at it. That's the best I can say. My, thank you very much for that. Um, any more questions? Do we have um, a... Uh, the, I can't read his writing here. Rafiq. Mrs. Bashan Rafiq? Yes. She, she's the president of the All Pakistan Women Association of UK. And she, she, she should take that seat. Thank you so much. This is very, very, very... I'm honored. Yes. Uh, I was uh, just listening to this. It's a very good question of how, what do you do, how do you make men start to take account of the women that are a part of their lives. Yesterday we had Asma Jahangir talk at a gathering and she insisted that more women should be invited. And I also wrote to a lot of women from my organization to come. And there must have been a ratio of about 5% women and 95% men. I request all of you here, and especially the gentlemen, that when you go to any such sessions, please bring your wives and your daughters with you. Please. It's not that there are no women, but you all leave them behind. The other thing was I just mentioned, that it's a long process to educate people. One of the greatest things I have learned in this country is how when people were drinking and driving and people were being killed on the streets, the British government started a, pro a program on television which says uh, about drinking and driving. Mm -hmm. The other thing about seat belts, club click every trip. And by the time these, pro these things came up on television, we were unconsciously, wherever we went, we just felt for the belt to put it on. There were so many people who would not drink if they went out, and they changed the idea. And this, I think, is something that you have to do about women in Pakistani culture, that they have to be brought out. I mean, amazing women, amazing daughters, amazing wives. If you get half the nation to stand up, Pakistan, will be way ahead of itself. 52% women. And they are holding this, that country up on their shoulders without ever being acknowledged. And I think that has to be done, and governments can only do it. Uh, organizations, NGOs can't do it. And you are in government, and you are going to no, do it. You will be, you will be. No, but it's not. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
you. Any more questions on the floor? Hi. Um, drawing upon what Natasha, Ms. this is for Mrs. Kasuri, uh, drawing upon what sort of Natasha asked you in your response, um, you mentioned that I think one of the channels or mediums through which you can bring that change is uh, strengthening and establishing institutions. Um, one of the biggest institutions in Pakistan, I feel, is religion. Um, do you think if Pakistan was a secular society, women would be more empowered? It's a very sensitive and tricky question you've asked me <laughs> to put me on the spot. But <laughs> my personal opinion, I think religion is a very personal thing between a person and their God. And personally speaking again, and I'm not speaking for my party, I, I respect human beings who can help others, who can assist others, who um, you know, will go out of their way to reach out for those who are not as privileged as they are. I really don't care who they are uh, praying to, who their God is, because I have always maintained and felt that uh, Allah is Rabbul Alameen, which means that he is the Allah of the entire universe. He's not just the God of Muslims. So I don't know what else to say. I think that religion is very important. It plays a very significant role in the lives of each and every human being. But then it is something personal to us. And I think that uh, politics and religion can coexist together, but they don't necessarily have to be intermingled or um, we can't say that there can be no politics without religion or vice versa. So I think they can be kept, kept separately and um, you know the citizens um, of any country, uh, regardless of what faith they practice, if they are citizens of a country, they should have equal rights. And it is the case in Pakistan, by the way. All citizens of Pakistan, according to the Constitution of Pakistan, have the same rights. No, but that's not true. Darling, that's not true that women don't get equal rights. Women. In Islam, women get the maximum amount of rights. And there are property rights, there are rights to inheritance, there's rights to divorces, to marriage, to everything. But unfortunately, for political reasons and for the, the uh, vested self-interest agendas of some politicians and people who are in the, you know, in the corridors of power, they uh, don't want them enforced. The women of Pakistan have a lot of rights from Islam and from the constitution of Pakistan. So it's not to say that Sharia doesn't give them rights. I'm not an expert on Sharia law, to be very honest, but I mean I have an idea about the powerful women, the women who come from affluent families, the educated women, they can own land, they own properties, no one bothers them. It's because they are influential people. But the rural women, when I speak of the vast majority of uh, you know women in our country, they don't have access to those rights and they're not because there's no implementation. There's no retribution for you know violation of their rights. And these are basic fundamental human rights. So okay, and the lady on my left who's been waiting patiently, so you are But there's a reason for that because when a woman inherits, she inherits a certain percentage from her uh, parent but that is, because, that is less than the brothers would inherit because she is yet to inherit a percentage from her husband which the husband will, which the sons will not be inheriting from the wives. Okay, that is a separate thing. But this was the logic given behind it for a woman to be inheriting. And in Islam, a woman should be getting married, so should a man. It is something which is uh, suggested we should do. So there, it has been justified in that way. Hi, I am Razia and I'm from Women and Girls Empowerment Sport. It's a domestic violence charity and I'm solicitor and I am human rights activist as well. Uh, it's very good uh, issue our brother, he picked up uh, Islam and empowering women. I think uh, women were empowered when Islam came. The wife of Holy Prophet, Hazrat Khatija after Islam, was the best businesswoman. Hazrat Aisha, who was the last wife of Holy Prophet, he was giving lectures, 
to all men and uh, men are coming from so far areas and uh, if you see the example of Hajj women and men they go together for Hajj Islam doesn't say women can't go with men and another example if you uh, see Islam and Pakistan actually the mullah, mullahs in Pakistan sorry to say they have given us wrong picture of Islam if you go and see Saudi Arabia the women at the time of marriage they demand okay this property should go my name then I will marry you Islam given a lot of rights to women but the perception of Islam is not correct in Islam the reason there is cultural issues from subcontinent we are more closer to India to Hinduism this is the grassroots issue we have to tackle culture and Islam the perception of Islam is uh, giving wrong by the media or by the mullahs thank you very much gentleman in the blue shirt over there. Um, I have a question for Fazia Kasuri thank you very much um, you've now got a government in the province of KPK um, at a very recent uh, by-election certain women in your province were not allowed to vote they did not come out to vote why was the government completely silent over the issue in your own province where you have where you have government now and could you also please tell us how many women do you have in your cabinet in in the province itself and is it not true that most of the seats in parliament whether they're at the provincial level or at the national level where women representation is matters uh, are not elected representatives they are nominated by the parties on the um, which of course is constitutionally allowed because there are certain reserved seats for women and aren't there more showpieces as opposed to women who've come from the social sector or from sectors where they're actually serving communities just before you answer that, Fazia, can you just introduce yourself, who you are and where, which organization you're from? Okay, my name is Sheikh Rahman. I'm president of Petra Global Energy Group. Thank you very much. Over to you. Okay, so in answer to your first question, because you asked three, <laughs> the first one was? Yes. Okay, yes. Recently there was a by-election in KPK, as in other parts of the country, and there were two, three constituencies where women were barred from going to the polling stations to cast their vote. Now, I agree, we have a government there, but this was not government uh, instituted, this whole process, uh, but there was huge condemnation by Imran Khan, I was here at the time. I also on Twitter and Facebook and through the media condemned that action. Imran Khan demanded that there should be a re-election in those constituencies. And I know that in Islamabad, when I have been part of the uh, you know, uh, various uh, seminars that I've had and discussions with UN women, I was part of the team. We were advocating that at least there should be a minimum of 10 to 15 percent representation and women vote in any constituency across Pakistan because if, it, if that is absent then that particular election should be declared null and void so we have spoken about it it's not like we've been quiet on that Imran Khan has spoken I've spoken and various other voices in the country have been raised and yes it was not right and it should not have happened and since then I think the Supreme Court already has ordered re-election in those constituencies. So that's a positive development. Your second question was about uh, how many women in the KPK cabinet? Okay. Yes, you have a very good question. We have a coalition there with, an other, uh, with two other political parties. And I agree with you that there should have been more uh, representation of women in the cabinet. But we do have one or two advisors, and they are um, very senior women. You know, from the, the um, one is an educationist, the other is a uh, healthcare, a renowned doctor. She's been for many years and a professor. But 
I am not saying that we are perfect in KPK. We are also part of the same society. We are also evolving. We are talking about it. At least we are providing a platform where a debate is being initiated from. So we also have a lot to learn. I am not saying I am empowered. I am fighting for my right also as I am fighting for thousands of other women who I are members of our party. I did not wish to bring party. that up. Sorry? I did not wish to bring up the fact that you yourself were a victim of this. No, but I agree. Yes, I have been. But I have no inhibition in saying that yes. But it was not just about me. It was about thousands of other women in our party who have worked, who needed to be represented, who needed to be acknowledged, their work, their contribution. And now your most important question about women in the parliament. We have a lot of women in the parliament. We have nearly like 17% um, or over 17% actually. I just found out from Andrea that she's saying that we have 23% women in, in the parliament. So that's good. There's some that have come, maybe this is the reserve quota, but there's some who have come directly uh, through a direct election. Okay. so. My point is, and this is something that our party also advocates, and Imran Khan spoke about it uh, several months ago. I feel that all the women who go on reserved quotas into the Senate and the National Assemblies of Pakistan, there needs to be some sort of an electoral criteria. They need to represent constituencies. They need to be representative of some people. At the present moment, the way the system is working, these parliamentary seats are just like gifts to women. I mean, they could have come from anywhere. They don't. But I feel that women who are working at the grassroots level, women who have a commitment, have, a lo have experience, who are working in their communities with people, they are the ones who need to then go as their representatives into the assemblies so they can raise their voices for their problems. Not women from affluent families and women who have political clout and who have the back of men. It should be women who should be there on their own steam because of their accomplishments and because of their services to, to uh, other women in, in, you know, in other parts of the country. So I, I'm a great advocate of that. I'm going to lobby for that. Imran Khan already spoke about that. And we want that women should go. And we are not against the reserve quota because mind you, that is only to facilitate the entry of women into parliaments. It's needed. It's necessary. It will be a process. It will take times, maybe a couple of decades, where women are emotionally, financially, from the education point of view, uh, you know, able and capable on their own to make a difference. But today they need to be facilitated and brought forward. Thank you and very much. And that is what the quota does. So Thank you very much for that. So We've only got uh, time for three more questions, I'm afraid, because time is against us. So we we'll have to, to move on. Do someone who hasn't asked a question. Would you be able to promise that you would strive to do that and achieve that during your parliamentary term, at least in the KPK province? Asking no, a politician I, think it to is, make I will answer this very quickly, but I think it would be nice if some questions could be addressed to Lady Mayor as exactly. well. Exactly. I know that this is a predominantly audience that is interested in Pakistan. I can promise that we'll try. What we can achieve, I cannot guarantee, neither can I promise. But I promise as an individual, and because I work with lots of women and youth, and I'm very passionate about what I do, that I'm going to give it my best. I'm going to raise my voice. You support me. OK, uh, gentlemen over there, can you introduce yourself, please, before you say? Yeah, my name is Harris. I'm currently an economics and finance student. Um, what I've noticed about Pakistan is every time I've visited is that the family system is very strong there. It's a very family-oriented structure. So where would you set the limit between women being empowered and over-empowered, where I feel that would compromise like the family system in Pakistan? I'd appreciate if you can answer. Thank you very much. Good question. Right now, we're not even focusing on over-empowerment. <laughs> right now, we haven't even gotten to the basic first step.
It's a long process. But we have to take that first step. And it's very crucial, it's very critical. There are serious issues in Pakistan, and especially women. See, there's a great amount of violence against women. And you know, we have to fight that. There are all these old, um, traditional, hated laws that uh, you know take away from the self-esteem of women. Um, you know, that uh, leave women lonely, desolate, alone, and uh, financially they're so dependent on the males. So we have to improve a lot of things. So over empowerment will come much later. I don't think there's any other any woman in Pakistan, even uh, if I may take the liberty of making this comment, Benazir Bhutto was the Prime Minister of Pakistan, but she was not over empowered. Most people have the impression that um, things really went wrong after her marriage. So there are issues, you know, there are lots of issues, but women have to make an effort and we have to keep talking about it. And maybe collectively, you know, someday we will see some improvement. Okay, thank you. Um, Mrs. Dodana. My name is Dordana and I'm the Chief Executive of Pearl Education Foundation. Um, our slogan is Margins to Mainstream. And we started with just 100 Muslim women in this country to educate them just by basic English language. Now we've gone up to like 8,000 students uh, in the last six years. Uh, my point is that fine, yes, we started with just a group of Muslim women, but at the same time, I think we needed to integrate them. In order to integrate them into the main society, you have to get other people, other communities as well. And that's what we have done, is that we've got, uh, yesterday I was in one of my um, centers, and we've, we had in one classroom, we had seven, 18 nationalities sitting there, which is an amazing thing that, a Muslim, thank you, a Muslim woman, woman wearing a burqa and a Muslim, her husband, a Jewish sitting across this uh, board. And then you've got some young European uh, students coming, uh, recently arri arrival. Um, these are the things that we need to find. We don't understand. I don't come from a political background. Neither I would like to. When it comes to talk about working for the, for the masses, working for the real people. My question is, if I would like to take our project, I've been asked several times to take our project to extend it there, we're taking it to Sri Lanka, we're taking it to Bangladesh. I would love to take it to Pakistan. Pakistan is my motherland. Britain is my homeland. We've been living here for so many years. But uh, my heart is obviously is there. I like to go and help people out there. What, is, what about the class system? How do you tackle with that? What about the security? You don't want to have another Malala there. I'm not talking about, I mean, there are so many lovely, beautiful girls. I've seen them in mountains, in, in Kashmir, when I, where I travel there. You see some beautiful girls, little girls, six years, seven years old girl. They are walking up six miles up into the mountain. Where are you going? I'm going to up to school. So it doesn't mean that the girls are not going to school in Pakistan, so please don't think that nothing nice is happening in Pakistan. I know for the fact because I have spent a lot of time during my BBC period in Pakistan in very rural areas. So how do we do that? How do we, if we like to take our, our project to uh, rural areas or even in the, in the main city area, how do you how do we combat, combat that uh, situation, the security situation? Thank you. Absolutely, there is a great security um, situation in Pakistan. I agree with you there. But I also want to tell you, Dardana, that first of all, what you're doing is fantastic. Hats off to you. It's really very inspiring. Um, brave young Malala. It was an isolated incident. It's not that it's happening all the time in Pakistan. But of course, you know, I mean, um, in the media, it came across as like, you know, oh gosh, one young girl raising her voice for education and she gets shot. She's a lovely young lady. I went to meet her and thank God she's alive and hopefully she, she'll do a lot of good things in her lifetime. But there are thousands of Malalas in Pakistan. There are thousands of brave women, you know, who are going up to Gilgit and Baltistan and into such difficult terrain, setting up schools 
schools, healthcare clinics, volunteer services, you know, trying to empower other women. These are very positive things that are happening in Pakistan. Unfortunately, they don't make it into the media, especially the Western media. They don't get here. You know, the, you know how they say, bad news always travels very fast. <laughs> Good news gets lost on the way. That is what happens. So please, I encourage you to bring your success formula to Pakistan. Thank Please. you. I think that's something that the media has in common on East and West, and they like negative news, don't they? Revelant, in fact. Okay, can we have a last but one question from the gentleman there, please? Great, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Councillor Afzal Akram, and I am the husband of this empowered woman on my left, Natasha Sheikh. And now and again, she makes a mistake to let me speak as well, and this is one of those mistakes. Now, as a council, uh, cabinet member and former deputy leader of my own council, uh, we are the second largest Pakistani community which resides there. So I get invited to a lot of events on women empowerment, um, some actually arranged by women themselves, and some by mosques and other places as well. And one of the things I see is I'm either addressing or participating in an event, a debate, which is either primarily full of women or primarily full of men. And we're talking about women empowerment. For me, that formula doesn't work. Because if you're addressing and talking to a couple of hundred women, yes, they may be sold on what you've said, but they then need to go home and sell that to their husband, brother, father, etc., and etc. And vice versa with the men, I'm sorry to say, it's a case of I better not go home and say this to my wife in case she becomes empowered um, as well. And I, I have a laugh and joke some friends on that. I think we need to practice what we preach. Um, my wife and I, for example, around the London scene virtually are tied together and we go together. I mean, it's got so staged if one of us turns up and the other doesn't, it's a case that the other person must be ill. And we're asked, why is so and so not there? And coming back to Pakistan, it's about culture. And I think we have some very positive aspects of culture in Pakistan. I was born here in the UK. Okay? Yet my parents have invested the Pakistani culture in me. And I like to think I have the best of the East and the West. And it's what I do with that now. A lot of the time, and education is key to this. And I talk and I debate on and I talk about educating our young people for the future. I think for women empowerment, and I think, Fozer, you touched on this before yourself, I think for women empowerment, we need to actually educate the husband and wife together. It's got to be done as a team. And what I would like to see in future, whether, and I'm talking to everybody here, whether here in the UK or in Pakistan, where we have events, we have debates, and the panel is actually made up of Mr. and Mrs. Kasuri. I'm sorry, I don't know if you're married or not, but Mr. and Mrs. Kasuri. Mr. and Mrs. Dr. Chuktai, Madam Mayor with her husband. Because what I'd like to see is, how does it work in a relationship? I can talk about us. I can talk about us. And I know my wife's very empowered. We work together. But I also know, as a husband, she respects me 150%. She talks about me, speaks to me. That gives me more impetus to actually empower her even more. And vice versa. So that trust, that respect has to be mutual and it has to be two-way for it to work. And I don't think you can get that from each other. I think you can probably get that from shared stories from people on how it works for them. And more importantly, maybe where it hasn't worked so you can make changes. So it's a plea for the future. Let's do some more debates around that where we get couples together and we actually do some in-depth work. Because if you get the parents and get them empowered, they will in turn teach their children. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And um, the lady at the back there, did you want to ask a question? No, you don't want to ask a question. So, last question. Uh, Amina's hard of you. She's my daughter. And when I think about working in Pakistan, uh, I have sent my own daughter to stay there with hearing problem. Going into for three years, she stayed there alone. So that is an example that how much we love uh, to work and help. And I would, you know, I, I think it'd be really nice if Amina can express some words. Okay, um, my name is Amina Isai. I'm an asset I pick every day. So basically, when I was born, I cannot be able to read, write, and talk. I just survive now. And when I went to Lahore, it was um, a culture shock for me. It turns up, um, how can I explain? Humanity, special needs, um, communication, 
in, I, I don't know where she starts, but in this country, we have everything in life. For example, we have museums, we have galleries, we have um, safety rules, look at left and right, we have everything in order, black and white, um, from A, B, C, G to death. In Pakistan, we have none of that. But in small minority level, I feel that I had a lot to catch up. For example, the women, the boys are very hungry for the knowledge and education, more than average in the country. They are aware of the education, the knowledge in the museum, more than the people in the country. So um, I was 10 years behind, and I had to call up very fast in the hall. I had to have myself for the people to help me. And I think I had trash for them. I had changed a lot in the hall. I like you when you come back. I'm glad I came back on a professional level to work in the system. But I will never forget my root and my um, spiritual and humanity level of trash for me on education level there. Thank you. Thank you. I must say, Amina, Amina Ansari, she is a brilliant artist, wonderful. So look her up, she's got some great paintings. Um, the Dr. Shoa? Mr. Okay, I'm bigging you up there. <laughs> Please ask a question. Uh, my name is Muhammad Shoaib Sheikh, and I'm the General Secretary of Pakistani Professional Forum. Our membership consists of uh, people from higher professions. Um, our chairman was due to um, represent the forum, but um, I, he had some, something came up um, that she couldn't um, uh, miss, so I have been asked, I am here in his place. Um, <clears throat> I must congratulate, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Chokhtai uh, and um, the um, um, Hammersmith Council for organizing this such an important uh, seminar. Um, Thank you, um, uh, Mrs. Kasuri, Fazi Kasuri, for your great contributions. Um, I, although I'm not a PTI member, but I believe in admiring, commending what is good, no matter who does it, who says it, and criticizing uh, what is not good, no matter who says or does it. I think the, the uh, problem of um, empowerment of uh, women uh, depends on the economic independence, and economic, economic independence depends on education, but this is, this is something that uh, depends on the other, um, and that makes it difficult, this cycle, to break. Um, I, <coughs> um, I like to say here that um, the Prophet of Islam, 1400 years ago, gave women right, rights, and the empowerment comes with rights. And I'll quote what he said 1400 years ago. Oh people, it is true that you have certain rights with regard to your women, but they also have right over you. If they are right to your right, then to them belongs the right to be fed and clothed in kindness. Do treat your women well and be kind to them, for they are your partners and committed helpers. Remember, this was said in 1400 years ago, when it was customary to bury females. And this is what Islam did um, for empowerment of women 14 years ago. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, a quick question to our Lady Mayor. Can I go back to Councillor Satira Anjum? Thank you very much. I'm very much aware of the time. Um, I want to ask you. I want to ask you that. I mean, we are not free from problems here. We are also fighting for more political representation in Parliament and Council, and issues like uh, equal pay and equal opportunities. What message would you like to give to women of Pakistan through Fozia when she goes back? What she should be saying about the women of West? I think first to send them. First, to send them my very best wishes and to say that I'm, we're, we're all listening, the world is watching you, and we're hoping that a really peaceful and productive solution will be found. I think, as the old saying was, Rome wasn't built in a night. All these things take a certain amount of time, a lot of persistence and a lot of tolerance, and perhaps a lot of suffering, but in the end, it does come right. And so I wish you all the best in that respect.
And as regards how to go about it, I think you're probably the best people to know because you're the people on the ground. I can only look from the outside and say how we do it here. And it's different because you have different cultural habits and I'm listening to them now and I think what you've just said about Mohammed's fairness to women is something that should be perhaps brought to the attention of more people. Um, it's, it, it would perhaps smooth the path a little towards them getting a fairer deal. But a lot of you are rising anyway. I mean, goodness me, we've got people in this room who are all doing extremely well. And the young councillor, I think, um, is a star, the one from um, Buckinghamshire, isn't she? The, the, the youngest. Is she gone Spinner. now? Yes, she yes. had to go. Yes. Busy politician. Um, thank you. Our very, very, very last question um, goes to Lord Shakat Khan. Is that right? I don't have any questions. Oh. What I just probably would like to comment is that do you think that sometime it is the women themselves who are also part of the problem, particularly those that who are in the hierarchy, who are the beneficiaries? You mentioned some of those ladies that who are benefiting either because they get tickets to the parliament, either they benefit from it. Uh, that is not taking away any problem from the women, uh, men side as well, but that in particularly. Uh, whether it's Margaret Thatcher or whether it's uh, uh, Benazir Bhutto, that sometimes they themselves become part of the very problem that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Is that a question you're saying? Yes. Oh, well, perhaps you'd like to you answer. go ahead. I've spoken a lot. <laughs> <laughs> more qualified to answer. You see, now, this is why women should run the world, right? Because they're diplomatic. Um, I, do, I kind of understand where you're coming from. And, uh, and you know, some of the times this is true. It, there are, but, you know, I mean, there's these kind of self-interests always prevalent in any society. And uh, that is why I say that rights are something that we have to fight for. No one's going to give it to us on a platter. We won't get it. It will always be the rule of the mighty. They are the ones who are going to enforce their will. They'll bulldoze through it if need be. So this is where our role comes in. You know, good, educated, caring people all over the world, regardless of where, where they belong to or what part of the world they live in. But uh, this is where we have a role. And we, I personally think that each one of us should try to give it our best. And uh, we should speak for those who, you know, the lower segments of society, people who need help, people who are weak, who are voiceless, we need to become their voice. What else can I say? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to give the closing remarks over to our lovely Mayor. Thank you very much, panel. Well, I, I'm going to add a little word to what Fazi was saying because there's a power that you women have that you perhaps got it so long and had it so long you don't realize you've got it. They say, the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Now it's up to you to train your little boys the way that you think the world should be so that it becomes their will when they grow up. And that's a very powerful thing that we've had since time began. At any rate, what I'd now like to do is to say I've been very interested in hearing all that you have to say. I think we've all learnt something and we've all, I think pretty well everybody's managed to say something one way or another. I'd like to thank our hosts very much and Chiptai for doing, as usual, brilliant arrangement of everything and even overcoming the appalling traffic jam of three hours. He's pulled the event off in the end and thank you to his staff too, who the IT boys and all the rest and to you of course, been a marvellous organiser. So thank you for coming, wish you all the very best and we'll look forward to seeing the programme. Thank, thank you. you. I just like to uh, uh, close this program on the note of thank you and also want to say one thing that in certain societies women empowerment is, a, is pulling up but in some societies it's only a handshake and that is the definition, the difference of definition of women empowerment in Eastern and Western culture. Let's not define it by one definition but accept that it can differ from West to East. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.